another Clear Mountain interview. Uh, today, uh, I feel very fortunate to be uh, inviting Richard Lang uh, onto the podcast. So Richard, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. So I'll just read a quick biography of Richard. So Richard Lang was a student of Douglas Harding, the author of On Having No Head, and is the found, who was the founder of a cont contemplation method called The Headless Way. As Richard describes it, the headless way is a modern way of seeing our true nature, the limitless space we are looking out of. Richard has been practicing and sharing the headless way for over 50 years now, and has also written several books about it. His mission is to make seeing our true nature as widely available as possible. So that's a biography. Um, and then something else on your website I thought was a, another look at it. So Richard is also... Um, from the perspective of an observer, looking at him from several feet, Richard Lang is one person among about 8 billion other human beings on this planet. He was conceived in his mother's womb, then born as a human baby. Gradually, he took on the arts and crafts of being human, learning to smile, crawl, walk, and talk. As an adult, he continues developing, taking on a range of responsibilities. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a great, uh, great biography. Um, <laughs> Before that, mm. I was a little cell in the cosmic soup, but that's okay. going back even further. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly uh, for, I think most of the people who watch our channel might not yet know who you are or not yet familiar with the Headless Way. Um, so just by further way of introduction, uh, I've been listening to teachings from Richard and from uh, Douglas for a couple years now. And really finding benefit specifically in the skillful means of yeah, realizing that from first person point of view, uh, we can't see our own head. And um, uh, I learned about this on the uh, Waking Up podcast or the Waking Up app uh, through Sam Harris, which Richard has been on and has quite a few, um, maybe even over 20 uh, guided meditations on. Um, so yeah, I've just found a lot of personal benefit in this, this practice. So yeah, thank you, Richard. Well, a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, would you want to say anything else by way of introduction, um, just on the human biographical level of who you are, how you came to this practice? Yes. Well, shortly after I came out of my mother's womb, <laughs> <laughs> my brother arrived 10 minutes later. I'm a twin. So okay. there you go. And... Um, when I was 17, I was interested in, in spirituality, and I, that's when I met Douglas Harding. And uh, he, he had some experiments and shared these experiments with me and others. And like you said, pointed out, you can't see your own head, instead you see the world. And he had done a lot of research on this and... Uh, said to people, uh, if you're interested this, in this, come and visit. So I visited him at his home many, many times, became friends with him. And very quickly, I realized that for me, this was such a, an inspiring, fresh way of awakening to your true nature, a modern way. Uh, uh, and uh, not only was I inspired by him and the method, um, but I was inspired to be involved in sharing it from when I was a teenager. So that's more than 50 years ago. So I spent my life enjoying this vision and sharing it as well as I can. And the other thing to say is that Douglas didn't make students, he made friends. When you see this, uh, you become a friend if you want, uh, because there's nothing that you've got now that someone else doesn't have, really. You're aware of that, at least. Oh, hmm. I'll turn my email off there. Probably a friend. Probably a friend emailing. Yeah, so uh, what I was saying there was that going and staying with him and becoming friends with him and all that, I got to know a lot of people that were his friends and made my own friends who were aware of their headless true nature. And that was so incredibly supportive, was to be around others in a community where everyone was aware of this. So there wasn't a kind of hierarchy in that sense. 
because everyone sees the same nothing. And I have found that tremendously important in my life, being in a community of friends who are uh, enjoying this. And I continue to enjoy that, and I consider you a friend now, Camilo. So uh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. And, and I really, so I reached out to Richard, um, it's actually on Christmas Day, and uh, just seeing if he'd be up for an interview, because I'd listened to so many of your uh, your talks, your guided meditations. And I think even the same day, Richard, you may have responded. And I was just so touched. And um, your kindness is really, uh, it really does uh, expand out from the screen. So um, yeah, it's been quite good to, to meet you. I, I'm curious, maybe just uh, before we go too much further, um, some of the language uh, that you've been using and uh, of you know our true nature or um, in other places you speak about perhaps one's self nature or who we really are. This is something which for Western Theravada or Theravada curious, Theravada adjacent people uh, who are used to the language of not self, this might be something which is a bit triggering uh, where they say, wait a minute, aren't we, isn't there no self at the, at the essence, you know, at the, at the center, isn't there no self? What is this, who we truly are or et cetera? What would, how do you, how would you frame something to someone like that? Or what would you say if someone felt like they were having an issue with that? Well, first of all, I'll just say that uh, I did spend four years in a Vipassana meditation center. And uh, when I was in my uh, late 20s, and I, after a short while, was invited to train. And then I led 10-day Vipassana retreats for about three years. So I do have a at least a toe in that water. Um, but I would say that the experience of one's true nature is essentially non-verbal, non-conceptual, non-emotional even. It's just a plain observation, if you like. And that recognition for me frees me to use whatever words are appropriate. So I really don't feel attached to a particular language. I have my own language, I suppose. But uh, if someone doesn't like or doesn't resonate with the words I use, then choose your own. Um, self, not self, void form, all of these are very useful terms until they're not. <laughs> but the experience now, I'm looking out of this open space. My hands disappear into it. I'm looking at at you, Kavilo, and I'm face to no face with you. I trading faces. I'm looking at the single eye. These are all words for this nonverbal experience. And I, if I call this the self or the no self or true nature, um, I take the view that to see your true nature or this openness that you are, the void is the easiest thing in the world. Look for your head. And so then I am not in a position of trying to convince the other or persuade or argue, of course, uh, the reality of this. I, it's just true for everyone. And um, choose your own uh, words. Yeah, so, mm. yeah. Um, I think it would be helpful, actually, if you could. I mean, you've mentioned a couple things, you know, looking out of the single eye, turning back to... Um, yeah, looking back, um, would it be possible to maybe give a little bit more instruction for people who seem totally new to this? Like, what are you talking about headless way? Of course, I've got a head, you know, I'm looking out of my eyes, I can feel my face. And um, I think it would be really helpful if you could just give a couple minutes of uh, guided uh, guidance into this space that you're speaking to. Yes. Well, it's taking a fresh look at yourself. And... Um putting aside for the moment what everyone sees you to be, because I know from over there and on the screen now you can see my head, but what am I for myself? First person, as, as you said. And um, the viewer could try this, uh, that you just hold your hands out in front of you. And this is something a five-year-old would love to do. you know. And you see the gap between your hands and then you bring them back. And they get bigger and bigger, and then they disappear. Well, I say they disappear into the great void. And then I bring them forward, and magically, you see, I emerging out of nothing. I, from the outside, it's going past my head. Inside, disappear into the void. Or you can see my two eyes, and I see, 
When I look, I find one opening and the field of view fades out all the way around. They're just kind of hanging in the middle of nothing. And a, quite a well-known one is pointing. And you can point out at things, obviously. But when you point back at, at the place you're looking out of, I find just my finger. I don't find my head as well. So I'm pointing at the void or at clarity or space or depth or emptiness, you see. And then you put your other finger out and you point back out and there's no dividing line between the place you're looking out of and where you're looking at. Exactly, you see. There you go. There you go. And then if you close your eyes and ask yourself, on present evidence, how big are you? Well, I say, well, I can't tell. Or um, what shape am I? You see? And uh, just imagine you'd been just been born and you hadn't got language yet and you'd never looked in a mirror and no one had ever obviously told you you were a little baby or something. Now, for yourself, is there a dividing line between inside and outside? And how wide are you? How old are you? Do you have a name? See, now I say, well, no, I don't. See, now I open my eyes. See, the thing is that... Uh, from the outside, I close my eyes and open my eyes, but from the inside, I make the room disappear and make the room make reappear. You see? So, these are ways of um, getting me to attend to what it's like to be me without dismissing what others say or the mirror says. You see, the mirror shows me my face and you can see my face. So, I get that. That's what I am at a distance. But if you came up to me, you'd lose me. And you'd get a patch of skin and you'd get cells market almost nothing. I'm right here. I see nothing full of everything. <laughs> so how's that for a starter? That's great. Um, I'll say I'm, one other thing. One please. other thing is uh, when you look at someone, like I'm looking at you now, Camilo, and it, I, on the screen I can see two heads and they're separate. But when I look directly at you now, there's a head there too. No head, nothing, space. And... Uh, you are given right here in my awareness without anything in the way. And I, if I am to use language, and I say, well, I have your face instead of mine. I am empty for you. I am open for you. I am space for you. I am you. See, no dividing line. Richard, is there... Um, so two questions. I think some people listening, um, if this is the first time they're encountering this, might just say, so what? Like, okay, those are maybe interesting perceptions, but... But so what? Why should I give it any more than just the you know ten five seconds um, you know that I just listened to it? What what is the value of actually um, yeah looking back again? Okay, what is my finger pointing at? And um, yeah, what's what's the value of this? So what? Uh, lots, you see, lots and lots and lots. And I, I would say uh, the thing is that it, it, if you really want to find out the value, then try it out. If you want to find out the value of meditation, uh, you don't do it for 10 seconds and then say, that didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> right? you, you've got to hang out with it. And there are times when it won't mean anything and people will say, great, just hang on in there, you know, and then you will receive something. And it's the same, exactly the same with the headless way. But I would say that when I'm one, a couple of big so what's probably, I mean, lots, lots. Uh, but um, when I'm with friends or with enemies, <laughs> it's face to no face. I am empty for you. Uh, I It's two voices in one consciousness. It, it's a completely different way of being with people. Um, but the other thing is that uh, I would say, you see, this awareness, this space that's full of everything is free and unencumbered and nothing sticks on it. What anyone ever says or whatever, it's just clean, clear for everyone. And as you live with this pristine clarity and freedom and stillness, uh, peace really, you see, gradually, gradually that sinks in and you, you start to grow in a way, a, a kind of feeling of stability and inner uh, confidence or joy or freedom uh, and it, it's uh, <laughs> right you see uh, and you've suddenly discovered something that is just there all the time always available at will and in a sense totally on your side 
and fresh and just never lets you down in a way you think wow what a resource what what a kind of basic freedom to come from into all the struggles of your life and uh, I think the other thing to say is that I would say that uh, I, I gradually recognize wow, this so-called nothingness or void is just incredibly smart you know uh, it, it you can't limit it and, and that's where you're coming from and that's within you and that's behind you and so uh, there's a starter <laughs> yeah yeah that's interesting I think for I would imagine for some people certainly for myself I mean it starts off as just a perception a very useful perception I think especially for myself in social interactions so myself I've been a monk for uh, 14 plus years and um you know, we do have a lot of practices with the eyes closed, spend a lot of time meditating by ourselves with our eyes closed. Whereas when we're, yeah, now we're starting a monastery. So we go on alms round every day and there's much, you know, there's more interaction. We're teaching and uh, something different can happen, you know, for someone who's not used to bringing a sense of emptiness and spaciousness into social interactions where it almost reifies the self. You look at someone else and then you recognize that they're looking at you and they've got a story about you and that makes me self-conscious and they're, it's basically this, you know, self, selfing feedback loop and this kind of short circuits that it just, yeah, if someone is going to self me or not, they've got a story about me or they don't, it doesn't really matter because it just, it's like you're saying, it just doesn't stick. So I feel like as a skillful means for open-eyed, um, touching into a level of insight, it's, it's quite helpful. So Yes, you see, and there is an example of, uh, for me, of meeting someone that, you see, I don't know you, uh, uh, we, we've, we've chatted a bit before, but, uh, and you have just shared with me how this is benefiting you, and that inspires me, and you just disappeared, I don't know why. I think I think we're still together. This might happen, okay. but um, yeah, I can still hear you. Okay, so uh, this this inspires me. Your experience there is just uh, how wonderful it is to have friends who are exploring this and finding benefit in different ways, and we learn from each other. Uh, so that's wonderful. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, it, it is um, just really. Uh, uh, just a very loving thing to be aware of when you're with people. Yeah. So one thing I, I've done with Richard is uh, Richard has several uh, group meetings throughout the week, um, and we'll put a link to how people can find out more about that. Um, but I actually attended one of these, I think it was last week, um, and Richard is there, or I'm not sure if you're always there, but um, Richard was there, and there were probably 30 or more people who come on, and we go into breakout rooms and basically just uh, speak from this place. This, as I was saying, this starts off as a perceptual, it's a perception, a skillful means on, on one level that, oh, you know, emptiness, being space for the world. And I did find it to be, um, yeah, quite meaningful to be interacting with other people who are also practicing this. Like you were saying, Richard, this is just in general. If I know someone else's meditation object, whether it's a mantra or uh, the breath, when I'm with that person, it's all, there's this, the mirror neurons of meditate, the meditational mirror neurons kind of kick in and I kind of can uh, tune into the same space that they're in and doing it with people who are practicing the headless way uh, was actually quite therapeutic um, to be in a space where people are not selfing one another. You're not, you know, just creating stories about one another was just um, fascinating. I, I want to go back a little bit to your biography, um, two points. Um, one is just, you mentioned that you taught or lived and, and eventually ended up teaching at a Vipassana center. And I'm curious if that was, if you already knew about the, um, I think given the, your age, um, your ages of things, then you would have already have been introduced to the headless way by the time you were living at this Vipassana oh, yeah. center. But how did these two meld in your mind? Were they a good fit? Was it a total overlap of frameworks or was it a bit dicey? Well, 
uh, the the man who started the meditation center was called Diravamsa. He was the assistant abbot at a temple in South London. He, he was from Thailand. He was the Chow Koon or something, but he'd left the order by then and set this place up in England. But curiously, I, when I met Douglas Harding, it was at the London Buddhist Society Summer School back in 1970. And this guy, Diravamsa, was there. He was still in robes then. And every so often I would meet him over the years and, and Douglas knew him a bit. And then I heard him give a talk and he was giving a retreat near Cambridge where I was living. So I, I went on it and it, it impressed me. Now, I had known Douglas Harding for about eight years by then. I had read everything he'd written. I'd traveled with him, done lots of workshops, lived with it, had many, many friends that were sharing the headless way. And I did wonder, I thought, what are these people doing? What, what, you know, it's so easy, so simple. What, what, what are they doing on a retreat? Well, in my um, time, four years at this meditation center, I think looking back, what it did was that, because uh, I continued to enjoy being headless while I was there. I, I, I knew Douglas and invited him there and all of that. But it gave me a, an opportunity to be quiet and still. And I just personally needed that uh, in retrospect. I, I don't, I didn't know what I was going into when I went into it. I didn't know I was going to train and lead retreats at all. But on looking back, it was a, because I was aware of my true nature and I thought a lot about it. I just need, it was very therapeutic for me just to be quiet and still with it. So that was one benefit. Now, um, it was also, you know, very interesting to find out all about Vipassana and all of that kind of thing. And, um, but um, it, it was not a headless way place. It was a Vipassana place. And so when I led retreats, I was teaching Vipassana, not headless way. I could introduce it, but people had come for Vipassana. So that was very good for me in a way to let go of the way you know, and just travel without a, a, a form in a way, something like that. But um, I did have the the advantage in a way that I was now at home uh, with my with who I really was. I'd found who I was. And the thing about the Headless Way is you've got access to it any time. And so when I was on retreats, I was not... Um, well, one thing that the teacher said, which is basically how I understood it in a way, was he, he talked about his ex, what a long meditation was like, a long sit, you know, a few hours, what it was like. He said, a long sit is like a deep massage. You see, So in other words, a long sit isn't trying to find your true nature. A long sit is enjoying it and relaxing with it, right? <laughs> So my experience, by and large, you know, of the retreats and of sitting and meditation was an opportunity just to be without having to go and do a job or whatever, just to be with my true nature. You know, very relaxing, you see. And I find that these days, I, it, it's all, it's, you, you're home. But you hmm. now, so now what? Well, be at home. <laughs> be at home, you see, you've been, and, and relax. Now, I did see that uh, other people were struggling to find home. And so uh, I was not struggling to find home. I was at home. So that was my experience. But it was very valuable because um, it kind of freed me a little bit from thinking that Headless Way was the only way. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm currently attending a Mahayana university and having a somewhat similar experience. I mean, very Theravada, basically, since I decided to take on, um, uh, take robes and become interested in Theravada Buddhism in my early 20s. And I was totally still, you know, Theravada is my love. I love Pali, love studying Pali, but um, there's a narcissism of small differences and a kind of conceit of um, that my religion is, or my kind of faith and trajectory is the only way and um, can be quite limiting. So yeah, learning different Mahayana practices and also the headless way has been quite opening up. And um, yeah, I'm 
I'm glad that there's space for that um, in our Sangha. Speaking of which, um, I have heard that Douglas Harding was actually friends with, or or knew at least, uh, Ajahn Sumedho, who's kind of the grand grandfather of our... Sumedho? Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, I met Sumedho. I mean, I went along to uh, Amravati, uh, the meditation center, and met him there, but I met him at Douglas's house too. And uh, he used to visit occasionally, and they felt on the same wavelength, you know. Yes, mm. I, think I sent you a photo, didn't I, Douglas? And yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a great photo of, uh, I think, Douglas in his older years. He's in a wheelchair sitting, and then yeah. Lumpur Sumedho there just uh, standing next to him, smiling. So, You see, the thing is that, uh, Covilo, that I... I uh this is the headless way is is you see who you are so to speak if i can use that language okay. I, i'm attending to who i am uh, but uh, and that is 100 percent. you can't do it wrong i say and you can't half see your headlessness and can't see it better or worse than anyone else but what happens over the years is gradually it sinks in and it reveals itself or reveals truths, insights, like in Vipassana, insights come and then you've got to let them go. You see, the corruption of insight, don't they? As soon as you start to hold on to an insight, you've lost it and it, you've got to let go. And what happens is that you realize, I realize that this is a natural process, that uh, it, it's cyclical, it's, it's a rhythm. The insight comes and then it goes. And it has to go for the next one to come, obviously, really. You know, spring, summer, autumn, winter kind of thing. And that, of course, what does not change is your true nature. It's like the, the eye of the storm. It's still there. But as you live with it, it reveals deeper and deeper things. And I'm convinced it will, go, it will never end, never end and go deeper and deeper. And one of the things, uh, uh, so that's a kind of maturing process. I see it in the community, the Sangha, our Sangha. I see that there's a gradual recognition in the community that we're home, that you can't do it wrong, and that uh, is a nonverbal experience, so you can't define it. So that frees us from arguing points of dogma or whatever. You know, that oh, that's, that's undermined. And also that everyone's response to it is valid. See, you, 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 how can you, you, uh, you my, my growth is a deepening recognition. I'm talking to you now, and I'm talking to you as if you're completely aware of your true nature, as I would put it, that you are the same space. There are not even two spaces, one consciousness, two voices in one consciousness. Now, that is not something you learn. That's something that kind of blows your mind every time it occurs to you, in a way. You know? And so it's the one talking to itself here. Now, this is, it, it just goes deeper and deeper. And uh, it goes deeper and deeper uh, in, in one's friendships, this recognition that there's one. Yeah, fantastic thing. Yeah, one, one thing I appreciate about Lumpur Sumedho's teachings is his non-attachment to dogmas. I mean, he's really able to uh, find benefit where he's able to find benefit. And if he finds benefit in the teachings of Ramana Maharshi or uh, in Douglas Harding, he's able to, to use those practices and not be uh, bothered that they're not, you know, traditional Theravada. And for myself, I mean, how I'm able to reconcile it, because I do um, deeply value, you know, I mean, right view is a big part. It's the first of the eightfold path, factor, path factors. And um, so I always do try to see things within a view, within a, a, a lens of, of Theravada Buddhism, but I feel like the headless way is, can be conceived of as totally within that, that view of reality as just a, a deep accessible, um, doorway into the truth of not self. And I'm, I'm curious if, if that rings true with you or if you're able to, does that language, is that anathema to the way you think of things or is that, no? No, not at all, you see. And uh, I, um, see, if I listen to you and hear where you're coming from, I mean, you're coming from who you really are, but you're coming through your experience. 
I said, well, just let me listen. Let me, what is your insight? What is your angle? You see, that's going to be different from mine. And how do you see it? And and how does it work for you? And, you know, I'm going to learn from that. I, In a sense, I've got nothing to prove. I, I'm, you know, I, I mean, I'm here talking about the headless way, but, you know, two voices in one consciousness, that's already coming out of nothing. That is already uh, an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, uh, you see, I, I think uh, gradually, uh, I, I and my friends, I would say, but anyway, uh, gradually you, you, I think that maturing, so you can't mature your true nature, the void, it doesn't mature, it's, it's 100% mature already, it's a happened, it is, you know, that you're being, uh, that, that is, that is what you are. But I, I think that uh, as I would say that in a, a certain way, the process of maturing is at ever deeper levels saying yes. Saying yes. Yes to who you are, to what is. It, 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 uh, uh, and you'll never fully say yes. You know, that's the, the joy of it. But um, you see... As a baby, you're headless, I would say, and you don't know it. You've got no language. Growing up, you learn to go outside yourself and see yourself through the eyes of others in the mirror and recognize who you are as a person and uh, identify with that. And everyone is feeding that back to you and telling you, telling me I'm Richard and I have to stand up and say, yes, I am Richard. I've got to join in. And by the time I was an adult, you know, or a young adult in my case, I was totally convinced I was Richard and you were somebody over there and we were head to head and uh, everybody was supporting that in the way we talked and behaved, you see. So that is, you've got to adulthood. And then don't stop there. Go on to awaken, reawaken to your true nature, which you've always been there. You've never seen your head. But because you've been away from it, coming back to it, you see it with fresh eyes. It's a prodigal son. If you've never been away from home, you don't know the joy of coming back home. And uh, uh, yeah, so um, coming back home uh, to the place you never left is, uh, you know, is it, it, yeah. It, it just um, keeps revealing new new beauties, really. Yeah, mm. I like that conception of being able to say yes uh, to more things. Um, I think it's not a very Theravada. I mean, I think, uh, you know, some people who are, uh, you know, quite fixed on, on certain views would say, but wait, we have to say no. We have to say no tomorrow. We have to say no to, um, yeah, to our addictions, say no to um, these things. And I think there is a level of truth there. But, you know, just on that topic of insight, of Vipassana, you know, I mentioned that the headless way, tuning into this first-person perspective of emptiness, is it a a window into not self? But for me, it's also a a broadening of entrance into dukkha. You know, the capacity to hold suffering um, or that which is difficult. You know, there's more space to hold that. So, uh, being able to say yes to a uh, my capacity to say, okay, yes, dukkha does exist. It's the first noble truth. Um, that's, that's huge. And I feel like this is a, a very good, skillful means to say yes to, um, yeah, the truth of reality, even the, the, you know, it, it's easy speaking with you brings up a lot of joy, you know, but, you know, of course, the, the path, as much joy as we can bring to it, the better, but, you know, be also being able to um, speak with and be with the the dukkha of of life as well that which is unsatisfactory could you speak to that the um how the headless way uh, influences one's capacity to um yeah be with that which is unsatisfactory yes well you see when you're a baby you're wide open and you can't say no you don't know your boundary uh you need adults to protect you Growing up is seeing yourself from outside, seeing your boundary and learning, hopefully, as well as saying yes, to say no. And uh, you'll never be perfect, you know, <laughs> speaking for myself. But that is absolutely vital 
uh, thing to to get a handle on, isn't it? Uh, becoming aware of your separate self and the separate self of others and respecting boundaries. Now, when you wake up to who you really are, I say there's no boundary, but you that includes a sense of boundary and it includes the ability to say no. You don't suddenly become a kind of doormat. Uh, in fact, I would say you can be um, stand up for yourself better. So... Uh, here's a little experiment, though, that, that, that looks into stress and dukkha, suffering. So, so I'm, I'm looking down at my body and I can see my body and see my arm. I don't see my head, so my body disappears about here into the great void. But I'm looking down at my hand, you see, coming out of this headless void. <laughs> They're going to put me in hospital soon, you know. Anyway, uh, I can feel my hand. So I say, my body's coming out of the great void, see? and the sensations are there, arising in the great void. I can feel my hand, you know, just moving the fingers about. You could try this, uh, viewer. Now, I'm going to make my hand into a fist. You can try this. So there's a bit of stress there, a bit of tension. Now, does that affect the space? No, it doesn't. The stress arises in the space, see. So this is a fantastic thing to know, that your core, your true nature, your emptiness, whatever, it's not affected. Now, but i still got stress. It's not stopping the stress. So actually, it'd be a very good moment now to stop making stress and just relax your hand. You see, you can say no. You say, enough. I can say, enough of that. Thank you. Please leave. You know, I, I do not. That goes along with being capacity for the whole situation. The capacity for the whole situation includes you saying... Um, you'll have to leave now, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm not afraid. <laughs> or whatever. Or, you know, uh, oh, I can see I'm eating too much chocolate. <laughs> whatever. Hmm. You know, all that still goes on. But now, does awareness that you're, that there's a spit, there's an, a zone in you, a center that is unaffected, does that help you cope better with life is full of problems? Life is problem. Life is one problem after another. If you think, oh, my God, yeah, another problem. Welcome to life. That is the nature of life. But so does awareness of your true nature help you deal with problems better, with loss, with grief, with pain, you know, with, with things not going your way? Well, test out, but what's the alternative, you see? Uh, just not be aware of your true nature? <laughs> you know, I, 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 well, you know, take the money, you know, to, bring that into the equation and see how this awareness that who you are is absolutely free and uh, still and uh, good somehow and you know uh, even while you're dealing you know with pain I've had injuries recently you know and it, well uh, did it stop the injury? No. Did it stop me sometimes being really frustrated? No. But was there behind it all and through it all? Well, of course, every time I look, yeah. So that's where it deepens, you see, it deepens. It'll never, I'll never achieve any kind of, you know, final state. That We know that. Vipassana, there's no final state, mm. right? Except your being, mm. as it were, if you like, whatever. So um, I think that, you see, the yes uh, would be to, yeah, life is suffering. Life is difficult, you know, and uh, it makes a difference. It, it, so I'll, I'll, uh, years ago, so growing up, I was quite shy, like a lot of people, and occasionally that my self-consciousness would get the better of me and it would be really difficult, but it wouldn't last that long, you know, and I'd ride it out and I'd be through it, you see, more or less. I knew it was all, always a kind of problem there. When I met Douglas Harding, he told me that he was just incredibly self-conscious when he was a young man. By the time I met him, not a sign, not a, never. I never saw it in 35 years. And he said, well, it's because I'm seeing I'm invisible. I'm space for the world, you see. That's, oh, I want that. I want that, you see. All right. That's a good reason to do it, you see. And... Uh, about 20 years ago, and it kind of helped a bit, kind of helped a bit, but it never quite seemed to do the trick, you know. And about 20 years ago, it suddenly came up in panic attacks. 
I got, and I, it was just disabling. I mean, it was intense. And it was, I understood what it was. It was this intense self-consciousness of being under inspection by others, you see, and feeling judged, I suppose, all part of it. And it was the most difficult period. It lasted a couple of years, more or less. But the panic attacks didn't carry on so intensely, but it was disabling in some ways. And uh, I had to look at it, and uh, I had to deal with it somehow. I knew how to, and I knew in my heart that there was something good about this. It was trying to something good could come out of it. Not, it, not no guarantee, uh, but that was my philosophy because I felt that. Where has this come from? It's come out the source. The source is good. So it must know what it's doing. I don't, you know, yeah. but there you go. <laughs> and what happened was uh, I two things, really. One, uh, in a terms of understanding, I realized that as a baby, I, have no, I was not self-conscious. So I was this space without that sense of self and other. And during my life, like everyone, this sense of self and other had arisen within consciousness. And it's so taken over that I've forgotten about consciousness. It was just self and other, you see, which is what you need to do to become a person. Right? So totally normal. And when I saw who I was, I had the idea it would get rid of this feeling of self and other of separation. It would get rid of it, you see. It didn't. It didn't. I thought, I'm doing something wrong. See, Well, I couldn't get rid of it. So two, two things happened. One is, I understood it had arisen within consciousness. I asked myself, why did consciousness produce that? And my gradual discovery was, because it wanted to, fit, to talk to itself. Hmm. It wanted the sense of others. It, wa it didn't want to just be one. It wanted to have the joy of sh talking about itself to itself as if it's talking to another, right? You know, all that... Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the many, the one becoming many, it's not new, but it was new for me in a lived experience. Yeah. And what happened was when I realized the rationale for it, I stopped resisting it. I said yes to it. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, I see why. Okay. You see, it's not something to get rid of, it's something to enjoy. Right? Yeah. And I said yes to it. Of course, as soon as you start to gradually say yes at ever deeper level to it, it changes, yeah. you see. Wow, what a, the, the void, your true nature, gives gifts, gifts to you all the time, but heavily disguised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, even just this morning. So we go on alms. That's basically I'm walking through town, walking through Seattle, uh, wearing this, my robes um, and carrying my alms bowl. And most people have no idea what we are, um, you know, so people... You know, most people don't stare, but there is a, a strange sense of self-consciousness that can come into it. And um, I appreciate that you're, you know, framing spiritual maturity as being able, the capacity to say yes to more. But that, that capacity for saying yes also includes a skill and nuance in when and how to say no. So this morning, you know, walking just on my alms round, wearing what I usually wear, and just there's a, a feeling of you know, this call to perform, you know, this, I need to, you know, be as much a monk in my walking or, you know, eye contact with people as possible. But then coming into this uh, headless space, this perception that from right now, from my first person perspective, I can't see my own face. There's just, there's just space here that, that I'm aware of. I was able to say, okay, there's this, there's a level of self-consciousness here. And Part of the reaction to that is I want to, you know, smile at that person or, or not smile at that person and, and just say, oh, I can do both of those. I can say, no, I'm not going to smile or, and it doesn't affect my level of, of care and loving kindness. And, and that's another thing I, I'd like to talk about you, talk with you about is, um, so in Theravada scriptures, we've got this chant called the suffusion of the divine abidings, where we talk about those four boundless hearts of loving kindness or metta, karuna, compassion, mudita, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And we talk about those as being radiant, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will, and going out in all four directions, above and below. And it's, 
it really is a um, a way, an entrance, a Theravada entrance into this spacious awareness. And I'm curious if you could talk about this, the dovetailing of this sense of loving kindness or well-wishing, how that um, is a part of, if it is, of the headless way. Yes. Well, um, see, I'm talking to you now, Kovalo, and um, I am touching into the recognition that you're speaking from the same space as I'm speaking from. And uh, uh, so uh, this unites me with you. Uh, Richard's still different from Corvillo, and I'm in London and you're in Seattle. But at the same time, it's a great mystery and it, it, it we're speaking from the same, in the same consciousness space. And I think this is namaste, isn't it? This is recognizing in the other is the one, like you are the one. And uh, the words don't come close to it, really. But um, this uh, is where the barriers come down. The, the, there's barriers between you and me, but not in, there's no barrier in, in consciousness. There's a, a weird, mysterious, strange, wonderful thing. Um, and this consciousness uh, has no boundary. Uh, it's everywhere. I mean, it, it, beyond everywhere. And I could say, you see, I'm looking out of this consciousness, which I feel you are. I'm talking to you as someone who understands this, because, I mean, you might think about it differently, but someone who is this, let's put it that way. But I would say that the single eye I'm looking out of, everything is in it, including sensations and thoughts and feelings. Everything is given in this one consciousness. So the image I sometimes use, and I, I think there's a similar Buddhist image, but anyway... I think the Buddhist image, but I may be wrong, is of a mother hen with her wings around her chicks. So you completely enclose. The mother hen is completely enclosing and protecting her chicks, and the chicks must feel just totally safe and loved. Well, when I see who I am, uh, the space, everything arises in it. I mean, I mean that. Which is just, you know, I'm not in the world. The world is in me. That really, if you take that seriously, you should be lying on the floor waiting for the ambulance. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> mind blowing. And uh, the image is that I have as this tr clear, open consciousness that, that has no boundary. My invisible arms go around the whole world. I mean, this world, this moment now with you and the room and whatever else is going on, my true nature, I, the one, consciousness, is just, it, I mean, it is inadequate to say my arms go around it, completely protecting or holding. Uh, it's love. There's no dividing line. I mean, not even one is in the other. It's just, so where does that take you? You know, I, I mean, that's love. That is um, how, you see, that's where, it, for the rest of my life, I hope that I can gradually receive this wonderful truth, which is so uniting. And it's true, you see. Uh, if, uh, uh, and does that lead to compassion? Yes. Because <laughs> you know, I, mean, I am you, or, you know, your voice is in me, your voice is mine. Uh, now, uh, I don't say that I behave as if this is true all the time. I'm trying to relax into it, into this incredible setup. <clears throat> it's not the way we were taught. You know, Rumi, Rumi, Rumi said, when you wake up to who you really are, and he's like, you know, and words, when you, when you see who you are, you realize it's not the way you were told. <laughs> <laughs> Understatement, <laughs> you know. So, and then you're free. I mean, you, you, you. This, it, it really doesn't matter what anyone says or does, because you, you're free. You're free. You know, that thing is that it doesn't then mean that you. In one sense, you see, you're totally free. Therefore, detached. Nothing can 
you know, stress you or hurt you or touch you. Or that. In the other way, there's no dividing line. You're completely engaged. I mean, more engaged than you can ever articulate. It was, you know, no dividing line. Now, this means to me that you take the brakes off in your life. You you go for it. You you know, there's nothing in the way. In every way, uh, I I can't see a a downside to it. Really, yeah. <laughs> I should have been a sales rep. <laughs> Richard, so this, this reminds me of, um, there's a beautiful discourse where the Buddha goes uh, to these three friends, actually people who he knew since childhood, Anuruddha and Kimbila and um, I believe Bhagu was one of them. And they're basically living and practicing together, living in this forest and practicing. And the Buddha asks them, um, are you getting enough alms food? They say yes. And then he says, um, are you living, are you uh, getting enough food? Basically, that's the first question. But then he goes to uh, communal harmony. Are you living in harmony? Are you not disputing with one another? Are you looking at each other with kindly eyes and blending like milk and water? And they give this beautiful response about how they are doing just that. And their final line is, we are like, we are multiple in body, nana kayang, but one in mind. So ekang chitang, we're multiple. It's as if, it's as if we are many in body, but uh, singular in mind. And that's a, uh, a beautiful perception to come to. I'm curious, something which happens though, is one is just beginning on this, um, this perception of oneness or the, this perception of non-duality, which does have a place in Theravada Buddhism. The word Advaita, which is a Sanskrit word, which means non-dual, does have a Pali cognate Advayang, which does come up in perceptual um, yeah, uh, ways of looking at the world. And what sometimes will shift one out of this perception, this unifying perception, is when you look at someone and you happen to catch direct eyesight with them. And it's almost like their eyeballs get you in this like self-creating tractor beam where they're, you are you, and don't give me any of this BS, you know? It's like, it's almost a a self-generating, self-perpetuating um, eye contact tractor beam. How do you relate to that? I know I had a family member who was into um, new age, uh, new age circles, and she said that she would do um, this kind of create this pink shield, actually, that would like keep people out. It wouldn't let people kind of come in and uh, attack her space, um, and. You know, presuming putting up a pink shield might not be the best for uh, oneness. What what is what are your skillful means for um, situations like that when it's, it, it seems like some kind of external trigger is um, is shaking my um, my acknowledgement of this interior spaciousness? Well, I would say this is going to happen. <laughs> And uh, it will keep happening. In one way or another, life will deliver what you don't want. And I think deep down, I think one grows to realize that um, gradually, with resistance, we go kicking and screaming into heaven, um, dragged into heaven. But uh, one gradually, I think, recognizes that there's something in this that is of value, but it's in disguise. But it reminds me of um i have a couple of old friends colin and carol and they met douglas before me so they're mid 70s now and, and so they've lived with this for 60 years and um colin first met douglas and then he was talking to carol his wife you know they were 20 or something and um she for hours, day into the night, you know, into the early hours. And she said, I just can't get it. I just can't get what you're talking about. And Colin said, well, when you look out, imagine it's a beam, kind of like, like you were saying, kind of like, look, you've got a beam. You're looking out at something. Now turn that beam around so it comes straight back to you. This is like the eyes gazing. Now, where does it land anywhere? And Carol went, no. What, is that it? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, that's incredibly simple, Colin. Yeah, it is. See. Now, uh, one of the things that's rather fun uh, is uh, when um, you're with people 
uh, I don't think it matters whether they're aware of the headless nature or not, but it matters in terms of articulating it, because if they're not, you can't talk about it, but you can. So uh, anyway, what, what you sort of do is, is, because growing up, you, as a baby, you were totally unfazed if someone looked at you. Hmm. You know, uh, it didn't land anywhere. Their gaze didn't land anywhere. And you just, you looked at the, their eyes without feeling self -conscious. And then you looked at the wall behind them and neither had more charge, you know. Hmm. Now, growing up, you learn that I see, actually. Douglas interpreted the myth of um, Odysseus to, uh, in, in these terms. So Odysseus uh, had to go on this epic journey to kill Medusa, Gorg the Gorgon, who had snakes instead of... <laughs> and if you, if you, um, if she caught your eye, you would turn to stone, see. But he, get, he got various things on the way, like a shield and a sandals that meant he could fly and a magic purse. And the shield was like a mirror. So you probably know the story, but the way he killed Medusa... Uh, cut off her head because he couldn't look at her uh, he could be turned to stone was to look in the mirror and he could then cut her head off well Douglas interpreted this as eyes when they look at you they turn you to stone they reify you, you see you feel looked at you feel under inspection you freeze you see like that how do you deal with it you look in the mirror of your true nature see then you're free, you're invisible. So their, their gaze now does not fall anywhere. This is the truth. It's the, the, it's the truth that will set you free, not some technique. It's the truth. Now, the truth is not, doesn't come in easy form. But And you, you don't have to sort of kind of work at it, really. I mean, just recognize now that anyone's gaze, do it when it's easy, with a friend, you know. But when they look towards you, they're looking into nothing, see, from your point of view, you see. So there's not putting up a shield. Or rather, this is the shield of your true nature, which is, which is just this openness, you see. So, of course, take appropriate action where you need. Walk away. Say no. Say, why are you looking? You know, it doesn't mean that you can't do a technique like your friend did. I mean, whatever you need to do. But behind all that, see that it lands nowhere. And as this, don't expect results straight away, you know, or final results. But uh, uh, in my experience, uh, and this has been a kind of bugbear for me, is this self-consciousness and feeling under inspection and frozen and, you know, all of that. Well, do what you can. Breathe. <laughs> you know, breathe. <laughs> Whatever. All of that, you still apply. But also, you, uh, you water the root. Water the root and the flower will take care of itself. Well, you need to trim the flower a bit sometimes or uh, prune the rose or whatever, but water the root. And the truth will, the truth will, uh, it's it, it will give you what you need. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to touch. You know, we, um, we, there's this experiment that Douglas Harding developed because the face to no face thing is so powerful. And the face to face thing, thing is so powerful and it is confrontation the feeling i'm behind a head you know in a head behind a face up against the world you know threatened by the world confronting the world and when you see who you see basically you don't face to no face well way back 1971 he was in canada and um so some years before he was in india and he went to visit ananda moima who is an indian saint she's dead now and when he left, she gave him her shawl, which was just a gift. They somehow connected and she said, I am you, I am you. And a little while later, he was trying to share headlessness with someone and he, he picked up the shawl and he put it around her head. So it just came out like a nun's habit. He said, what do you see inside the shawl? Well, of course, you don't, if I do this, it's like the shawl. You don't see your face, you see the world. It, it kind of brings your attention back to close because the, the hands are near and he did this workshop in Canada with Colin actually that I just mentioned and it was the first workshop they'd done and they needed to think of things to do and the organizer said do you want the participants to bring anything Douglas said get them to bring a towel like the shawl so during this first workshop 
he got people to put the towel around their head to, because it brought your attention close to where you're looking from. And then it's just a small step into the great void, you see, and your hands or the towel frame the world. They don't frame your face, see. And then he went up to Colin during this exercise and they were both wearing towels, so it was like a tunnel. And he got up in the middle of the night, went down to the kitchen, got a garbage bag, cut the bottom off, woke Colin up and they looked through this tunnel tube, this garbage bag, see? and it just cuts the room out, everything out, it's just face to nerve, it's really powerful. And uh, I used to, to uh, you, you know, we all did this, uh, you know, so it, it just highlighted the therapeutic value of being face to nerve, but I often used to find myself very frightened until, you know, of that, feeling under inspection, feeling kind of caught in the headlights, like you said, in a way. And uh, I, I think these things, the, uh, these reactions are so deeply in us growing up. Some, you know, it, more uh, kind of difficult to deal with than, than for others. For me, it was difficult. But um, as I've said, the key of seeing that you, the gaze lands nowhere, that you can't be reified, you don't have to prove it, you can say no, you can walk away, that's fine. You know, all of that, it, it, it gradually, I find, and I see it in my friends, that these things are gradually healed, you know, gradually. Yeah. Richard, thank you. Um, yeah, when, when I went to, that sounds like a, a great experiment, a number of great experiments you just put out there, just, but the actual, yeah, tunnel, tunnel vision experiment, um, yeah, I'll probably experiment with that at some point. Um, I was happy when I went to your group meeting to see other Theravada people there, um, to hear that uh, Douglas and yourself have met and known and maybe even you know, friends with uh, Ajahn Sumedho, Lumpur Sumedho. That's amazing. When I was at your group, um, yeah, a former monk, Amara Nato, uh, he yeah. was there. Um, I have got to talk with him a little bit. And then there was another couple people who were zoom zooming in from uh, a different meditation monastery uh, here in America. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious when you said earlier, just, um, it just clicked something in my mind. You said, oh yeah, you know, certain Buddhists, um, you know, don't, there's no end to the practice. I think that's really true in, in Zen circles. They say there's, there's no end. Basically the present moment is the, the only moment certain Zen circles, but in Theravada, there is this, you know, Nibbana, which is something which someone will eventually, uh, when they practice through practice attain but one of the the ways that nibbana is described and i'm curious to hear your response to this because i feel like it is certainly pointing in the same direction that we've been uh <laughs> this non-directional direction that we've been talking about um but is this is peaceful this is excellent namely the calming of all conditions the relinquishing of all acquisitions the destruction of craving, the fading away, the cessation, Nibbana. And, you know, it seems almost speculative and not quite useful for some people to say whether there's an end point when there'll be an ultimate awakening uh, or not. It's, it's speculative um, on a certain level, but this description of it um, for myself seems quite alive. You know, something, you know, taking the goal as the path in a sense and what the goal will eventually look like if if it's anything different that's something but um yeah what do you think about that 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 phrase that, that i just read well i can only speak from my own experience and what that means to me and what i say is that my true nature this space there's no suffering here there's nowhere to go. I'm home. I've always been here. So I would, there's a non-verbal experience, but I, I would feel quite comfortable saying this is the end of suffering, totally the end of suffering, whilst all this crazy life is going on. Mm. <laughs> you know? So uh, I think for me, uh, speaking just for myself here, uh, uh, I would say that my life is about saying yes at ever deeper levels, to this depth here that is absolutely free uh, and is the end of suffering. 
and uh, I, I uh, uh, the fact that I don't think about it all the time or struggle makes no difference to it. It is that is its nature, and uh, in terms of insight and growth and understanding, gradually kicking and screaming, I enter heaven. Heaven is nirvana. Is heaven? It's it, it freedom. It, it, but within it, you see, I'd say uh, for me, this 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 clarity, this freedom, of suffering, is ju- it is just so creative. It can't stop creating. It's obsessive. <laughs> it can't. The present moment. It's always creating this now, you see. And it's always full of opposites and ups and downs and uh, irresolution and resolutions and tension and, you know, and then resolution. And this is this is not a mistake. This is the drama. This is the play, you see, that has all these opposites going on in it, in heaven, in your true nature, in nirvana, where there's no suffering. Now, uh, uh, it makes a big difference to realize that, you see. Now, do you realize it forever? I say no. Realizations come and go. You know, it's there forever. Doesn't change. Timeless, you see. But but um, I, gradually relaxing into it. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you see, it, it it it's not a personal achievement, is it? It's just there. It's there, and it and it embraces for me my. My developing understanding, my developing surrender, you know. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think uh, it is. It is such a blessing that it is there, full power, all the time, and you don't have to turn it on or off or achieve it, you know. And you think, oh, can it be that good? Can it really be that good? You know, it is. <laughs> 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 Richard, it is, uh, it's just a joy speaking with you and, um, it's invigorating speaking with you. And, um, I will say there are times when my Theravada trigger warning warning kind of starts, uh, you know, going, but that kind of points to the superficiality of views. Cause you know, the actual present moment practice of what you're talking about is, um, yeah, it, it's more profound than, the kind of clinchiness to to certain views that come up, and um, yeah, I think that's it's a really healthy thing. And um, for any, um, yeah, just being being able to uh, hold and listen to, um, yeah, I, I think this will be this will definitely be a new practice for people, um, and people might not see the immediate, um, yeah, what what's what's there. But I would definitely encourage people to, um, yeah, to keep experimenting. And um, Richard, I so appreciate your um, your kindness with me, and uh, yeah, your generosity. Uh, everything on uh, the headless way it just seems like you just give and give and give. Um, so I'm very grateful for that, Richard. Well, I had a real delight to meet you and hang out with you, and uh, a meeting of minds, uh, to, you know, and. Uh, meeting of hearts and uh, so uh, uh, such a pleasure to connect with you and I hope we have many more meetings and, and meet face to no face in, in you know as it were at some point so uh, thank you thank you and uh, uh, you know marvelous that you're so open you're deep into that tradition and and yet you're you're hanging out with me and uh, you you know uh, you're I, I respect that so much. Uh, So a real delight uh, uh, to hang out with you.